Redemption Church, and thanks for joining us today. I invite you to stand as we worship Him with our lips, with our minds, with our hearts, with our souls. We worship Him with everything that we have, with everything that we are. We worship Him in spirit. We worship Him in truth. We lay everything at the feet of Jesus, and we give it all to Him.
wonderful, glorious you are. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. And 33 to 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever.
Jesus be the center of your church. Jesus be the center of your church. And every knee will bow, and every tongue shall confess you. it to the glory of your name. May you guide our path and let us be confident in knowing we will have peace and joy, knowing our life is pleasing unto you. This we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated, church. Amen and amen, TVC. Let me just grab this monstrosity. Hold on one second. There's a reason this is up here. You will see in just a moment. I love singing uh, songs like that sometimes where, where it's, it's few words and we're repeating them because uh, one of the things that's always uh, intrigued me about the scriptures is how often they repeat themselves, how often God repeats himself in his word. And, and the thing that I can uh, kind of come to and God tells us is that, that we tend to be forgetful people, right? We need, we need to be reminded. And so sometimes songs like this that remind us that Jesus is at the center are the things that, that uh, we keep repeating, not because there's some magical uh, uh, feeling in those words, but because it's a reminder to our souls. It's a reminder who we are worshiping and that he truly is and must be at the center of our lives. Amen? Well, TBC, good morning. My name is Eric Solomon, and I get to serve here as the campus pastor of this particular congregation. And, and I'm going to try to keep my head up. It seems like when I look down, the feedback comes. We'll see if I can do that. <laughs> Being, it's my privilege and my honor to be a campus pastor here, but it's not just because of the role, but because of here at this community, we are really uh, striving to and depending on God by his spirit to keep Jesus at the center. And in, in, in our worship, you'll notice we've, we've sung to Jesus, we've, we've even prayed, and one of the things that I want us to remember is that when we're here on Sunday mornings, that, that this is not the whole of the Christian life. This is part of it, an important piece of it, but the Christian life extends past Sunday, and it goes all on into the week. And we have to live lives that are, are exhibiting that, are showing that, but especially with open hands, right? Uh, being responsive to what the Lord is doing, being open to what he might do, and, and recognizing that all that we have is, is a gift, a gift that he has given us. There's a text in 1 Chronicles 29, where, where we, we see what it looks like for God's people to not only believe that everything we receive from God is a gift, but to live that out. 
in that text in 1 Chronicles 29, the context is that God's people are actually giving towards the building of God's temple. And, and, and one of Israel's kings, one of, the, one of the kings of God's people, prays like this. This is what he says. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Basically, Lord, we know that everything is yours, and so we praise you. But just a few verses later, he continues to pray, and this is what he says. Who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. Everything that the Lord has given us for our needs, everything that we give back to him, all of it comes from him. He is the source of everything that we have. And, and, and you'll notice that, that this text really says, God doesn't just give you for your needs. He also gives you to enable you to be generous, right? As a generous God, he is shaping a generous people. And when I talk about generosity here, you've, if you've been here before, you know that I don't just talk about generosity financially. We, we are, are people who live generous lives. We are generous with our finances, yes, but also with our time, with our skills, with our resources, with everything that the Lord has given us. Now, in specific, one of the ways we worship is by giving, right? And so all the different ways, we'll have them thrown up on the screen, ways that you can give here at TVC financially. And you can do that here in the service or throughout the week. But I also want to invite you to uh, consider and think and pray about how the Lord might be calling you to live a generous life. One of the best first steps that you can uh, uh, do to, as a community for us to do that is you'd actually let us know, hey, I, I want to live a generous life. I, I, I want to use my time. I want to use my skills. Because one of the things that Melissa and I and Ava and I, we, we like to do is, is play matchmaker, right? Connect people to other people to make sure we're actually, as a body, caring for one another. And so you'll notice on the way out, we talk about this for uh, prayer requests and things like that. But on the other side of these cards is a connect card. And if you're interested in being uh, someone that gives generously with all of your life, your resources, things like that, I want you to fill out the contact information and just let, hey, I, I, I want to help. And we will get in contact with you. Uh, I guarantee you this will make Melissa and my's day to figure out ways to connect you together. Okay? She's nodding over there if you don't know where she sits um, so, to prove it to you. Um, so when I talk about giving, we talk about giving financially, but I want us to be a generous people. Amen? I will stop belaboring the point. Um, the other thing that I want to do now is as we think about being generous people and, and all this discipleship and what it looks like to be a kind of person is I want us to pray. Right? Because when I talk about us obeying and doing these things, we are not doing them because out of our own strength we, we become a certain kind of people. But because God is making us into a certain kind of people and we submit to his transformative work. So when we pray, we are demonstrating that dependence upon him. So would you pray with me? Generous God, this morning we, uh, we approach your throne together as your people do so often in your word. Recognizing together that there is no God like you in all of heaven and in all of earth. You are holier than we could ever imagine. You are, you are more powerful than we could ever believe. You, you are so gracious and so generous. You don't turn away anyone who seeks you. It's hard to imagine that, that like your word says, that the, the heavens can't even contain you, and yet you want to be with us right here, right now. And that kind of love is, is really overwhelming at times. We read from your word earlier that the depth of your riches and, and wisdom and knowledge, they're, they're unsearchable. We have barely begun to, to scratch the surface, and Lord, it truly is incredible, and we praise you for who you are. We are grateful, and we are humbled by your love and by your care. And Lord, we know that you do care for us. And so we pray together as a church family for those uh, 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 within this family that you would continue to care for this family. We pray for those who are hurting physically and mentally, those who are dealing with all kinds of, of chronic pain or mental health issues or, or, or new and unexpected diagnoses, those who are, are recovering from or are even anticipating surgery. We pray that you would be present with them as their bodies heal, as you heal their minds as well, Lord, and that this healing would be a, a preview of the resurrection when you will fully restore our bodies and our minds, us completely before you. Lord, we pray that you would continue to provide for those in our church family who are struggling to find a job or, or trying to make ends meet. That you would continue to use us to love one another and, and demonstrate your love and care tangibly, actually. Lord, this morning we also pray that you would be present with those who, who grieve the loss of loved ones in this new year. 
those who, who grieve dreams that will never be or, or relationships that are lost to, to time and to sin. I pray that you would comfort them and that you would meet them in their loss and that you would use us as a family to come around them. Lord, we pray with joy for those families who have been blessed with new babies recently, that you would continue to love and strengthen them in this new season of life. We also pray for families that have started or even who continue to be on the journey of foster care and, and adoption, that you would be present with them in a special way, Lord, that they, that they might know your comforting presence and your strengthening hand. We pray for our siblings in the faith who are suffering with infertility or enduring the pain of loss and miscarriage, Lord, that you might be tender and, and gentle with them through us, that you might demonstrate your love to them in this darkness. Lord, I could keep going. There are so many of us who are suffering the brokenness of sin in one way or another. And Lord, we just ask that you would continue your restoring work in and among us here as this visible uh, family, this local expression of your body here on earth. We are dependent on you, Lord, and we also pray that you would continue to provide for us as a church family. Even specifically, we pray that you would continue to provide a place for us to meet. Lord, we know that the building is not the church. But we do ask that you would provide a building for your church to meet in, whether it be here or elsewhere. We pray that you would be gracious with us and that you would show us favor and that we might continue to, to gather and use, use a space like this for your glory and the good of others. We trust you. Whatever you do, we pray that you would continue to, to help us grow as a, a church family, that you would provide good and godly leaders, Lord, that might love us and shepherd us well, Lord, that you would continue to raise up people that love this church family, Lord and that help us grow closer to Jesus. And gracious God, together as we approach your word, we pray that you would continue to make this, this moment of worship where we are here gathered together into a holy moment, a time where we align our hearts to you and towards one another and, and out to our neighbors, that you would feed us from your word and that you would revive our faith. We pray that the preaching of your word would work its way into our hearts and into our lives individually and as a family, and you would change us and, and make us more like Jesus, that you might teach us and, and, and make us new even by the power of your word. We pray all these things in the powerful and matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, kids, we are grateful that you were worshiping with us this morning. You can head on out to your kids' life classrooms. You can follow uh, Tudors. I was like, I think that's who that is. Uh, <laughs> Now as the kids head out, and before I read out our passage for preaching this morning, I wanted to remind you of two quick family calendar events, okay? We've been talking about it for a while. The first is our annual meeting, which is this afternoon, 2.30 p.m. at the West Worship uh, Center in the West Chicago campus on North Avenue. Let me repeat that because that was convoluted. We in Bible Church, West Chicago campus on North Avenue is where we're meeting for our annual members meeting, 2.30 p.m. this afternoon. Now, if you're... Uh, 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 not sure what it's all about. There are information packets at the welcome desk. You can also download them online, privilegechurch.org slash annual meeting. And if you remember, this is your part of your commitment to participate in this church body, this church family, to not just be present and celebrate, but also to vote, to vote on, on how to steward our finances this next year, to vote on those who are going to love and, and shepherd us as elders. But it's not a closed door meeting. So if you're not a member, I want to invite you to come to celebrate with us, and to consider what it might look like for you to step further into uh, what it looks like to be committed to this church family as a member. The second thing I want to put on the family calendar uh, is uh, Sunday, February 27th, we're actually celebrating baptisms in the service. If you haven't been baptized, but you have uh, confessed and repented of your sins and you believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you to step further into obedience and to take this particular step of obedience and be baptized before your church family as a, a public profession of your faith. There's a class that we actually put together so we can talk through that a little bit more. That class will be on February 13th, and you can find out all the information and sign up on tribalitychurch.org slash baptism. Okay, so annual meeting this afternoon in West Chicago. Baptism on Sunday, February 27th. Our baptism class is on the 13th. If you have any questions about any of that, you can find me or Melissa. We'd love to help you out. Okay? Now, let me read the passage that we're going to be diving into today. Our preaching passage comes from Psalm 96, and then I'll invite our preacher up here. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one from the carts in the back. We're also going to be putting the, the text up on the screen, and I'll ask you to stand as we read from God's word. Psalm 96. Psalm 96. 
Our God speaks to us this morning from this psalm, and he says this. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Uh, ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all the creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. This is God's word. You may be seated. Well, this morning, I have the privilege of inviting another one of our preachers in our extended Wheaton Bible Church familia to shepherd us with the word of God. Pastor Jonathan Jerez, come on up. This preacher has led us in worship before, but now he's going to lead us by preaching. And I'm, for one, excited to sit under the preaching of God's word. Thank you, brother, for serving us in this way. And now you know why I have this particular pulpit up there. If you haven't noticed, he is six inches taller than me. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Tri Village Church. It's good to be with you. How are you guys doing? Good. Well, I'm happy to be here. And as Pastor Eric said, I've had to be here many, many times and had the privilege of leading you in worship. And I think that's exactly what I'm doing right now. I'm leading you in worship through the proclamation of the Word of God. My name is Jonathan Harris, and I'm the worship pastor here at our, at our church. And I oversee our services and our worship teams at our West Chicago campus, uh, our traditional service, our contemporary service, our Spanish service, and also here at Tri-Village. Um, and I, I love serving with people. I've had the, the joy of serving with people who love the Lord, who love Jesus, who want to see him, like we sang, at the center of everything we are and everything we do as a church and people who love the Lord, love Jesus, but people who also love this church, who love Wheaton Bible Church, who love Tri-Village Church, Iglesia del Pueblo. Uh, and I, I trust the Lord is at work here and that he dwells in the praises, the worship of his people. And so uh, we are going to talk about worship today. And uh, according to Jesus in John 4, God is in the business of seeking worshipers. That's what he is doing. Pastor John Piper once said, he, he wrote in his book, Let the Nations Be Glad, that missions exist because worship doesn't. I believe that's true. And I believe that that is true not only about missions, I believe that is true as well about everything we do and that ought to be a driving force fueling everything we do as individuals and as a church. We preach, we give, we serve, we evangelize, we do missions, we work, we build relationships, and all of that because we want to be and we want to seek worshipers for God. We want to partner with him in his business of seeking worshipers for him. Now, there's so much that we can say about worship. Uh, there's just a, such a broad, extensive, and complex uh, concept and doctrine in the Bible, and one that unfortunately has been uh, a cause for division and quarreling among God's people. And entire denominations Churches, congregations, friends, and sometimes even families divide over different perspectives and preferences when it comes to their understanding of worship. And many of us are familiar with 
the so-called worship wars. Have you ever heard of that? The worship wars. We see all throughout the Bible people arguing about the how-tos, how we should or shouldn't approach or worship God. And yet we see Jesus coming to define for us what that is. And one instance is John 4, when we find Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman uh, at the well. And we see that all she was focused on was the how-tos, the when, the where, the how. And Jesus comes to show her and us the kind of worship that the Father is truly seeking. And although I believe that as a church we must address the practical things about worship and implications of different worship expressions and what that looks like in particular context, today we're not going to go there. We're not going to focus on that. Today we're actually going to narrow it down and go back to the beginning and establish what I believe is the most central and foundational thing about worship. And we actually sang about it. It is our overflowing pleasure in the glory of God in Jesus Christ. That is the most central and foundational important thing about worship, both personal and corporate worship, our overflowing pleasure in the glory of God in Jesus. And I'm convinced that as a church, if we come to a good understanding of this and we strive uh, to keep, we are intentional about keeping this as the center, the focus of our corporate worship, then we will stand on solid biblical and theological foundation as we address some of those practical implications and things in the future. Now, there are many great passages in the Bible that we can go to to learn about worship. I have chosen Psalm 96. And there, in that psalm, I want to focus on verses 7 to 9. Those three verses have been key for me when it comes to how I think about worship, particularly a phrase that we're going to see in there. I believe this psalm captures the heart of worship and everything we're going to talk about today. So consider our sermon text, Psalm 96, a snapshot or a, a corporate application of this message. So here's where we're going. I'm going to give you four points, and we're going to walk through them together. Number one, the essence of worship. Number two, why we worship. Three, Sin and the corruption of our worship. Four, the gospel as the restoration of our pleasure in God. So pray with me. Father, I pray that you open our eyes today as we open your word, that by the power of your spirit, when I speak, that I would speak as one who speaks the word of God and not my own. I pray that your word would fall in good soil and bear fruit, that we may see the glory, the beauty, the majesty of Jesus and respond to you because he is great and he is worthy of praise. And it's in his name that we pray, amen, amen. So let's jump in and go to our point number one, the essence of worship. And I want to show you how this key phrase has helped me define what worship essentially is. And I believe worship is all about ascribing supreme worth or value to something. Verses 1 and 3, the first thing we see is they are an exhortation to us to express or demonstrate worship to the Lord through singing. We are commanded to sing to the Lord as a fitting expression of our worship, as a fitting response to the glory of God. And although we know that singing and music is not synonymous of worship, it is evident in the Bible that by God's design, he has given it a prominent place as one of the primary ways 
through which his people express worship to him in all seasons of life, especially when we are together. For example, Psalm 34, verse 1, it's one of my favorite call to worship. I will extol or exalt the Lord at all times, and his praise will always be on my lips. This is what that looked like in the Bible. Remember when God's people were rescued from Egypt, and God opened the Red Sea for them, and they had crossed to the other side, the first thing they do is they erupt in singing. They sing to the Lord out of joy, and we see that in Exodus 15. Remember when King Saul was afflicted with an evil spirit, and he sends the word, and David comes, what does he do for him? He delivers him through music. In 1 Samuel 16, when God wanted his people, when, we wanted, when he wanted his people to, to worship him and to learn about him and how to respond to him, what did he give us? He gave his people a huge collection of five big books full of prayers meant to be sung for him. 150 Psalms, the largest book of the Bible. Remember when Jesus spent his last night with his friends in the upper room. Before he went out to die, it says that he led them, they, they sang a hymn, they sang a song together. Matthew 26, verse 30. When Paul and Silas were in prison and they didn't know if they were gonna make it out alive, they spent what they thought could have been the last hours of their lives doing what? Singing. This is a fitting expression to those who have seen God. And when we get to Revelation, we get to see what worship looks like around the throne of God and to the Lamb in Revelation 5. And again, we hear a song of worship. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. So God's people are a singing people. And that's why verse 1, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all the people. And now I want us to see that the psalm doesn't just exhort us to worship the Lord, but it tells us why we ought to worship the Lord. Look at verse 4. It starts with the word for or because, which means the psalmist is going to give us the ground, the foundation, the reason for this extravagant expression of worship and singing to God from his people. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. And then verse 6, splendor, majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. So the reason we sing, the reason we worship is that God is great and he is most worthy of of praise. We worship because we have come to know his greatness. We have come to see his worth. We have seen the splendor and the majesty that are before him. And his greatness means that he is supreme and infinitely superior to everything and everyone else. God is truly the best in every way. And his worthiness means that who he is, what he is like, everything he does calls and demands a response from those who see him. Now, worship is always first an internal experience before it results and becomes an external act or expression God has absolutely no interest in mere external religious acts that don't flow from genuine love and affections for him. And this is why in Matthew 15, we see Jesus quoting Isaiah, saying, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. 
these people honor me or worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from, my, from, from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Do you notice the disconnect between their hearts and their acts of worship? And God says, that is all in vain. I don't want it. I am not interested in it. So church, hear this. There is always, always a sequential connection between the genuineness of our worship to God and our personal, real, relational knowledge of and encounter with the reality of God's surpassing greatness and his infinite worth. We will not worship him for who he is until we see his surpassing greatness and his infinite worth. The depth and the breadth of our worship will always be directly corresponded to how much we value God in our hearts. Singer-songwriter Paul Balash says it this way, we can't fake corporately what we don't foster privately. We might think we can, but first, God is not interested in it. And two, the fruit will eventually be seen. We can't fake corporately what we don't foster privately. And now I want to show you what I think this external, this internal experience means, where it comes from, how it leads us to do everything that we do in worship. So we do that by noticing, notice the phrase, ascribe to the Lord in verse 7. Ascribe to the Lord. Three times we are told to do this. Ascribe. That's an interesting word. Ascribe to the Lord. It could also be translated as give to the Lord. Attribute to him. Pay to the Lord. His presence, again, demands something. His presence is compelling. Remember verse 4. He is great and he is worthy, most worthy of praise. He deserves your praise. It is due his name. There is no middle ground. There is no negotiation when we encounter the Lord. Whether or not we respond to him, his presence demands a response. You owe him. Pay him. And do it now. What do we owe him? According to this psalm, glory and strength, power. But then it uses the word glory again. And we'll come back to that word in just a moment. Then there's the phrase, after all those three, ascribe to the Lord, ascribe to the Lord, ascribe to the Lord. And then verse 9, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. I think the ascribe to the Lord and the worship the Lord are two ways of saying the same thing. In other words, to worship is to ascribe to the Lord. And to ascribe to the Lord is to worship him. And then there's this word glory that occurs four times in these verses, verse three, six, seven, and eight. So whatever that word is, must be, it must be key to the psalmist here and very important to God. In the Bible, the word glory is the essence of God. And sometimes it is his presence in all its fullness or weight. It is the overwhelming supernatural manifestation of the majestic presence of God. His glory is the fundamental undivided sum of everything that God is together, all his qualities, all his excellencies, his attributes. It is like the actual meal put together after all the different ingredients come together, but undivided. To know and to encounter the glory of God is to know and encounter 
the whole of him. And the glory of God is a weighty concept in the Bible. And the reason for it is, is not God's actual physical weight, but the significance of its meaning. The presence of God. And it is very difficult to weigh and measure the fullness of God who fills all in all. But this phrase can also mean throughout the Bible, the worth or the value of God, the essence of who God is. So when you read the word glory in the Bible, it often could be translated the value, the worth, the essence of who God is. And I think that's what it means here in this song. We are supposed to ascribe, to pay, to, to give to the Lord the glory, the worth, the value due his name because we have seen him. So based on this, what is worship then? Worship, I want to give you this definition. Worship is the internal experience of the human heart that flows from ascribing supreme worth or value to something or someone, resulting then in expressions or acts of adoration and praise in fear, reverence, submission, and obedience. Here's what that means to the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1 verses 20 and 21, and then Philippians 3, 7 to 11. Listen to what the worth of God meant to him. I eagerly expect and hope that I will know, in no way be ashamed, but I have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering. Becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Christ was absolutely everything to him. Worth losing even his life. Whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth nothing I desire but you, says Psalm 73, nothing like him. He saw his infinite worth, his surpassing greatness, and it was enough for him. So the question for us is, do you know his surpassing greatness, the greatness of the Lord? Do you know his infinite worth? Do you know the glory have you encountered the glory of God? Have you seen, do you see the glory of God? What is his value to you? Those questions will lead us to worship. And the truth is we do that all the time. As human beings, that leads us to our second point. Why we worship, and the reason is because you and I are made for pleasure. We're made to ascribe. We're made to see, to behold, to be in awe and wonder and ascribe value in our hearts. That's the other aspect of this. We don't have to be called to worship. We are worshipers. We are born that way. We are worshiping all the time. So the psalm is not calling us to worship. It's calling us to worship the Lord. It is calling us to redirect, reorient our worship to the proper place. And in fact, worship is not just a Christian activity or experience. It is a human one. 
Everyone around the world right now is worshiping 24-7. Everyone is ascribing value and, in fact, supreme value to things all the time. Isn't that what we do with this? Probably most of us here have one of this. And we're willing to go into monthly plan uh, payments for to have one of these and the latest one. And as soon as the other one comes out, we want to get rid of this one and get the new one. And we are willing to do whatever it takes to get it, to pay whatever we think it's worth to get it. We ascribe value to our lives, to our careers, our professions, to our reputation, to our schools, to uh, sports. Uh, you name it, we do this all the time. And we're going to get there in a bit. But we ascribe supreme value to other things. And here's why. In the beginning, God made us to be in perfect harmony and communion with him, the source and the object of supreme and everlasting joy and pleasure. And then to experience legitimate pleasure in the gifts that he gave us and entrusted to us. We see that in Genesis 1, 28 and 31st. He saw that it was very good, took delight in it, and he said, you can have it all. It's all yours. Go, enjoy it, have pleasure, be like me. Don't hold back and give thanks. I gave this to you. You are made for God. You are made for pleasure. You cannot escape it. You see Mount Everest. And your jaw drops. You, you go to the Grand Canyon and you're in awe. You're made to feel this, this sense of being petite. <laughs> you're made for that. <laughs> because of the glory of God. You're made for him. And all this, these things are avenues, pointers, means for us to get to him. To enjoy him. Now, if, if we ought to love and enjoy God supremely over all things and keep our affections and our pleasure fixed on him above all things, then we must ask the question, why did he make the world the way he did? And then he filled it with all kinds of pleasures overflowing everywhere. And then he put us right in the middle of it and he gave it all. Look at creation and you'll realize that God really, really overdid it. He went overboard. He didn't stop at good enough. He wasn't happy with just giving us what was just necessary for us to live and to walk with him. He overfilled the cup with glory and beauty and wonder out of his joy in himself and his giving nature his desire to manifest his goodness in and to and through us. And he did that with our pleasure, eternal pleasure in mind. I believe the creation account shows not only that God is powerful to create things from nothing, but that he loves and rejoices and gives so much that he took the time and intentionality not just to create it from nothing, but to make it beautiful. To make it beautiful, wonderful. An author says, when God gives, he really gives. He really gives. Psalm 19, verse 1 to 4. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. And night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words whose voice is not heard. And yet their voice goes out through all the earth. And their words to the end of the world. Psalm 8 says, Our Lord, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory. Here's that word. Above the heavens, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moons, the stars, which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? 
So David couldn't believe God's creation. But more so, he couldn't believe that God was thinking of us when he made it. Our creative God made the light, the darkness, night, day, sun, moon, stars, planets, galaxies, dry land, sky, clouds, sea, grass, sand, small plants, and huge sequoias. Colorful flowers, rocks, and mountains, and hills, and valleys. And he gave us peaceful sunrise. And also the explosive red sunset. He decided that the wind should sing a song when it comes and goes. He gives us senses to see, to hear, to smell, to taste. And all of that to point us to the pleasure in him. All kinds of creatures on earth, the skies, the sea. And that's just what we've been able to see and discover. There's so much in this planet that we haven't even seen. Go to the bottom of the ocean. We have no idea what's there. And then there's this thing called universe. <laughs> Things that, not that just we, we don't see them, is that we don't even know they exist. <laughs> you see how small we are. Yet he thought of us when he gave us everything we can see. He said, all of it, except one tree, all of it is yours. Go enjoy it. God loves to overflow. He loves what he made. He really enjoys it. He takes delight in the work of his hands. And he made it for our pleasure in him. He made it, he made it as an invitation to us. He wants us to love him. He also wants us to love it as, a, as an avenue to loving him. To love it with him and enjoy it with him. Not apart from him. Not independently from him. He wants us to experience pleasure not only directly in him, but also in his gifts through everything he made. The things he made, the gifts he has given us are expressions of his overflowing, creative, and loving, giving nature, and we get to share in it. Everything we are, everything we have, they're meant to be received with gladness and gratefulness out of love for the giver, and meant to increase our enjoyment of the relationship we have with him. 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, everything God created is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. John Calvin once said, there is not one blade of grass. There is no color in this world that is not intended to make us rejoice. He points us to God. But also, he made us in his image to be like him. Which means he wants us to share in his creative and loving nature and giving nature. And that's why we are the way we are. That was the lie of the serpent. If you eat of the tree, you will be like God. Well, guess what? They were already like God. They were made in his image, in his likeness. They didn't need more than that. They were already, in every good way, they were like him. We are not God, but we are like him. That's why we keep creating and inventing and discovering and making use of all kinds of things to express our enjoyment of God through our God-given faculties. That is the overflow of the image of God in us. And this is why we often express worship through artistic and creative ways as a community. And by doing so, I believe we reflect the God who made all that. The God of Psalm 19, the God of Psalm 8. We reflect him and we also assimilate and learn truth and realities about him and the world and express our worship in so many different ways. And this is why throughout history, you can see societies and the church for sure making use of all kinds of things, especially creative arts. Things like musical expressions. Things like all kinds of instruments and paintings and sculpture and wall inscriptions and stained glass and cathedrals and murals and, and more things. All of that as an expression of their experience of this life, this world, with or without God. It teaches us, it helps us 
grasp complex truths about God and spiritual reality. And if you think of Jesus and his way of preaching and teaching people, walking around teaching about the kingdom of heaven, that's one of the best examples we have of the power of our imagination to understand the kingdom and worship. He often spoke in parables. He didn't speak just uh, truthful statements or preach sermons. He walked around telling people stories. And he used the fig tree, loaves of bread, the wind and the sea in the middle of a storm, fish and nets, tree leaves, flowers and birds, the temple building, children around him, right? Children around him, a poor widow in her offering, a thirsty woman in a well. He told stories of a hidden treasure, a lost pearl, a coin, a rebellious children who left their household, a house built on sand and rock, and many other things that fueled people's imagination and helped them understand the kingdom of God. Shouldn't we be the same way? Shouldn't we do the same? And that's why we do everything we do and celebrate all of the artistic expressions in our church community. And that's why the magnitude of this The true meaning of worship and our gifts and our pleasures in God makes our worship wars look really pathetic. We might say that it is because of the glory of God, but in the end, they're all about us. They're about us, what we want, what we like, what we don't want, what we don't like. It has nothing to do with the glory of God and our pleasure in him. The only reason our worship is acceptable and pleasing and beautiful to God is Jesus. And only Jesus. Not our musical style, not our language, not our ethnic or cultural background, not our church traditions, not our Christian family tree or heritage, not the way we dress to go to church, not even how well we did or did not this week. But Jesus and Jesus alone. All of that doesn't even come close to what worship is truly about. We are able and free to enter the most holy place, to bring our praise, our sacrifice, our offering, our songs, our gifts to God because of Jesus. So church, don't ever believe anything else. Don't let anything be the center of our worship. We are like him We're not him. So these things we do, they aren't marketing tools or ways to keep up with the times. They are the overflow of God's image and life and joy in us by his spirit and expressions of pleasure in him and in everything he has given to us. So let's be a church that celebrates all of this, that enjoys all of this in a God-centered and Christ-exalting way as a way to show our enjoyment and pleasure in him. And now you may ask, if we go to point three, what about sin? We are aware of all the dangers of this world and its pleasures and the catastrophic effects of loving the things of the world and ascribing supreme value to them. The Bible is full of warnings about idolatry and we must pay close attention to them. All these things we have talked about are great, sound wonderful, until we are hidden the face with the reality of sin and the fall. We don't live in the garden anymore. Our motives are not pure anymore. The disposition and inclination of our heart is no longer to live in enjoyment of God and his gifts. Sin entered the world through our disobedience and it ruined everything. Our unbelief, our idolatry, ungratefulness ruined our ability to experience pleasure in the way that we were made to. That's why Romans 1, 21, 23 says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave him thanks. But they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. So now we take everything that God has given us, all these pleasures, and we turn them into idols and they stab us in the back. Notice the problem of sin is not that we find pleasure in legitimate gifts that God has given us, but that we ignore God as the giver. We seek to enjoy everything he gives without him. 
We don't even thank him for it. We replace him with our gifts. So our natural inclination is to desire the gift apart from the giver. That is the heart of idolatry. It is not enjoying things too much. You shouldn't feel guilty because you enjoy certain things that God has given you. And you really, really enjoy them. Whether that's food, your family, your kids, music, whatever it is. It's okay. It's good to enjoy what God gives when we do it as an avenue to get to the giver. And we honor him as God and we receive it with thanksgiving. We thank him for it. And that is why C.S. Lewis said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. Our sin makes us settle for that which was meant to be a means or avenue to a greater satisfaction when we connect it to God, back to him. And we keep looking in the wrong places and we walk away empty. So because of sin, we now have three problems with our pleasure and worship. One is our hearts ascribe worth, value, glory to things that we shouldn't. Our hearts ascribe disproportionate worth, value, glory to legitimate things, pleasures, but that aren't worthy of supreme love. Our hearts don't find God worthy or su of supreme worth or value or glory. And that's why our psalm in verse 5 says, the God of the nations, that's us, our God, not the nations out there, that's us. <laughs> our gods are worthless idols. They're fake, they're useless, they're wor worthless, they're empty. But the Lord made the heavens. They will leave us empty. Isaiah says, those who worship the idols will become like them. So in the garden, worship was corrupted. Our pleasure was distorted. We lost God, the fountain of true pleasure. And we continue to try and replicate the infinite worth and greatness of our God with man-made, useless, futile, worthless, empty, broken systems. And it is obvious that we will never be satisfied because we weren't made to settle for lesser things. And you can, you can do the exercise with the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal what those things are in your heart. And that brings us to our final point. What do we do then? The gospel is the only hope to restore our pleasure in God. We must turn to the gospel as the only answer and through the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are restored to a relationship with God. He takes our unbelief, our idolatry, our ungratefulness upon his shoulders, and he gives us perfect righteousness as a gift, as a free gift of grace. Jesus is the fountain of true pleasure and living water that truly satisfies, and we receive him. So the gospel is not just, uh, doesn't just save us from the penalty and power of sin, but it also gives us a new heart, a new mind, the mind of Christ by the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 3. It gives us new impulses and inclinations, new lenses to see God, to see the world from his perspective. It restores our humanity. Jesus shows us how to be truly human and free. And then he frees us to be like him. And the gospel makes our overflowing enjoyment of the glory of God possible again. And in fact, it is in Jesus, in this Jesus of the gospel, that we best see the glory of God. That which we are meant to ascribe to the Lord, we come to know it in the face of Christ. It is in him that we fully behold and understand who God really is, what he is like, what his worth is, his greatness. Remember this word, this uh, verse from 2 Corinthians 4, 6, describing the experience of the gospel. For God who said, let shine out of darkness in Genesis, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. So remember that we said that it was really difficult to weigh and to measure the fullness of God, the glory of God, the value of God, his infinite worth, that fullness of God. How do we know it? Colossians 1.15, 19 says, the Son 
Jesus is the image of the invincible God, the invisible God. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And this is why the apostle Paul, uh, John said in his gospel, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the father, he has made him known. John 1, 18. The author of Hebrews also says in chapter one, in these last days, he has spoken. God has spoken to us by his son, who he appoint, appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son, and here it is, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact representation in print, the fingerprint of his being, sustaining all things by the, his powerful word. Hebrews 1, 2 and 3. Remember God told Moses, no man can see my glory and live. Well, we have seen it. And instead of dying, we live. We have eternal life by beholding the glory of God that we lost. And now we have life and fullness and joy and pleasure. Full of grace and truth. So you want to know the glory of God? Look to Jesus. He is the glory of God. He is the true temple, the means and the object of Christian worship. Worship is no longer bound to a specific location, to how to's, to our, a, a priest and earthly mediators between God and man. Jesus is all we need. So it is fitting that we sing, Jesus be the center. Nothing else matters. Be the center of my life. Be the center of it all. Be the center of this church. Be the center of our worship services, of our life groups, of our missions. Be the center of everything here. May it be Jesus, Jesus, and Jesus again and again. John 4, 21, 23, and 24, Jesus says, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or Jerusalem. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. There is no conflict between worship of the Father and worship of God the Son. Philippians 2 shows us that. True Christian worship is worship because of Jesus, through Jesus, and of Jesus, and this glorifies the Father who has exalted the Son above all things and given him the name above every name. And all things are from him and through him and for him. To him be the glory, Romans eleven thirty six, His life and death and resurrection ought to be our song. Colossians three sixteen. May the message of Christ, the word of Christ, the gospel dwell among you and in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. What news are better than this? What better song do we have? We were dead in our trespasses, and he made us alive together with Christ, and he has seated us with him in heavenly places, and everything that is his is now ours. So make him supreme in your affections, and make him supreme in your expressions. Who cares if you lose your composure? Who cares if other things you're crazy? Who cares? <laughs> it is Jesus we're talking about. It is the same person, that woman broke that alabaster jar and didn't care about her condition. She didn't care about the others. And guess what? Jesus was pleased with one person in the room and it wasn't those who were keeping their composure. It was with her. He loved her. What a love there is. And same with those kids running around and his disciples were mad. And he says, let them come. That's okay. That's what it's all about. You have to be like them. Just come to me. Love me. Ascribe to me the, the value, the worth that is due my name. 
So church, let's never let our worship be about or centered around anyone or anything else, but our overflowing pleasure in the glory of God in Jesus Christ. So what's our worship about? Jesus. You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased Uh, For God, persons from every tribe and language and people, nation, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Be praise and honor, glory, power forever and ever. And his church says, amen. So we conclude, what's the essence of worship? It is ascribing to the Lord, his supreme worth, value in our hearts and our church. And it is my desire that as a church, we treasure, we value his glory above all else, and that we live that out together, that we are God-centered people pointing each other to the glory of God constantly, that God would have his rightful place in each and every one of us so that we offer him undivided devotion in everything we are and everything we do and with all we have. Two, why do we worship? Because we were made to overflow with pleasure and joy in God and his gifts. So because we are a family of people who have been given new hearts, new lenses, new taste buds, to taste and see the greatness, the goodness, the glory, the pleasures of God, and flowing from God, may we be known as a place of contagious happiness and gratefulness and generosity and creativity and service. May that be the word that we hear about our church. Three, because we are aware and know that sin has corrupted the inclinations of our hearts and we've, made, we've been made free of the condemnation and the power of sin, but we still have indwelling sin within us. We know that our tendency will be to ascribe worth, value, glory to things that we shouldn't. To ascribe disproportionate worth, supreme value to legitimate things that aren't worth that much. Three, we know that we tend not to find God worthy of supreme worth, value, or glory. So this is why worshiping together really important this is why singing is really important we need you we need one another it doesn't matter if you sing well or not god wants your song and i need your song there will be days where i don't want to sing i will need your voice singing over me and you will need mine so you don't come here to hear pretty songs or watch a performance you come here to overflow with worship the Lord. And who knows, the collective sound of our corporate worship might from time to time save, literally save our lives as it washes over us, save our marriages, our relationship with our kids, save our spiritual vitality. We need our corporate expression of worship. We speak truth to one another, encourage one another, warn one another not to ascribe supreme worth to lesser things. We say, no, 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 that's not it. Don't put it there. It's God, not that. We help each other to ascribe supreme glory to the Lord. And four, the gospel is the only answer to restore our pleasure in him at whose right hand are pleasures forevermore. Nothing else can give us that. So I want us to be a church whose worship is enabled and fueled by the amazing reality of 2 Corinthians 4, 6. The light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Jesus is worthy. Amen? So may we be a church. Will we do that? Will we be that? We ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name be so. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you 
for eyes that see. I thank you for ears that hear. I thank you, Lord, for taste that we can say, we taste and see that you are good. Oh, Lord, give us more of you. Make us a people of pleasure in you. May those who come to this place look around and wonder, what do they have? What has happened to them? What can they see? And then by your spirit, continue. Oh, Lord, by grace, open eyes to your greatness and your infinite love. In Christ Jesus, and we pray all these things in his name. Church, let's stand as we respond and we ascribe him glory because he's worthy of all our praise. There's just one chief and two men's purpose. for existence all man's vain and high ambitions will one day be brought low will one day be brought low to treasure you above all others to love you like we love no other your greatness will be uncovered and all the earth will then know and all
that in all things, in our hearts, in our lives, in our church, you would be supreme. That is the prayer of our hearts. Church, receive this benediction from Romans 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, You may abound in hope and overflow, may I add, with great pleasure in the glory of God in Jesus Christ. And the church says, amen, amen. Church, we love you. You are sent.